Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. Our lecture today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. If you're interested in these programs, please join our membership. The membership is available online at preservelincoln.org. Um, today our, we have two speakers. Um, the first one is Dan Wirth. He's the Senior Principal and Project Manager at BVH Architects and was recently inducted into the College of Fellows of the Association of Preservation Technology International. For over 30 years, Dan has been involved in the preservation and adaption of historic structures locally and nationally, including the Nebraska State Capitol and modern icons such as the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, um, and Stewart Museum in Grand Island. Dan is one of the founding members and past president of PAL. Greg Mum, AIA, is a historical architect and a senior associate with BVH Architects. He's hailing from uh, Nova Scotia. Greg has been involved in hundreds of historic preservation projects at BVH over the past 12 years, including the William Jefferson Clinton birthplace home in Hope, Arkansas, recently as project designer and project architect at the Stewart Museum, and currently as project architect for the Nebraska State Capitol Courtyard Fountain Project. Please join me in welcoming Dan and Greg. Thank you, Eileen. It's good to be back at uh, the Powell Brand Bag Series and uh, see uh, all kinds of old friends and uh, new faces as well. As, uh, as the title of our talk today uh, implies, the, uh, the, the state of preservation is, is constantly changing. Um, now we're embracing uh, buildings as being historic that were constructed as recently as 1966. You know, that meets the 50-year uh, test of the uh, Secretary of Interior standards. So, um, things that were once uh, very new to us all of a sudden are becoming historic, uh, so to speak. And the interest in, uh, you know, the renewed interest, I guess, in post-war buildings, the mid-century modern, <clears throat> um, is not uh, so much nostalgic, uh, but there's also a, a, a kind of a growing or a groundswell of interest in uh, uh, modern buildings. Uh, kind of an aversion to uh, the wasteful uh, uh, habits of our society uh, and the destruction of resources that can be reused and, and help us along in a sustainable future. So the, the status of uh, uh, preservation is certainly changing and that's what we want to talk a little bit about today. Um, how the standards for preservation um, are, are in need of sometimes uh, a re-examination, especially with portfolio of modern buildings in front of us. Um, and then we want to end up with a case study showing you how we've been thinking about that recently. It's not a local example, but it certainly has uh, implications for many of the modern buildings in, in Lincoln. Uh, the case study in this case is the Stewart Museum. So, um, to start off our uh, discussion today, we want to uh, give you a, a you know a 10-minute uh, recap of the kind of the history of, of modern architecture. Um, those of you who are architectural historians in the in the audience, please forgive me for making this such a, an abbreviated uh, uh, recap. But um, you know the 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 sources of modernism are, are were gener generated, as you can see, by a number of different influences. Mainly it was a uh, reaction to the Industrial Revolution, kind of a change of attitude um, uh, stylistically against uh, kind of the excesses of Victorianism and those kinds of things. Certainly many of the, the credos or the philosophies that we all are aware of and, and have become used to um, over our uh, you know, lives of admiring architecture and being involved with the preservation of architecture. Many of those you see on the screen, you know, form follows function, uh, less is more by our, our friend uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe. And, uh, you know, crime is an ornament uh, that was espoused by Adolf Luce uh, in Vienna. 
So that kind of sets the stage that, uh, of course, modern architecture is, is certainly devoid of much of the ornamentation that was uh, uh, accompanying the, the traditional uh, buildings of our past. Um, so much so that many, um, you know, uh, treaties of, of uh, how to design modern buildings were produced. One of the most important ones, of course, was, was penned by Le Corbusier uh, in Towards a New Architecture, where he uh, gave very prescriptive uh, design uh, philosophies or, or directions on how to design modern buildings, including some of those notes that you see there about the open plan, uh, the facade that's free of any restraints from the interior, uh, you know, how to treat openings and, and great expanses of glass and even the concepts of roof gardens and outdoor spaces. The chronology of modern building uh, really begins in the, in the 1850s by the, uh, the use of uh, many new materials that started to free designers from the, uh, the structures of the past. This is a good example of the Crystal Palace in, in England, the use of cast iron, uh, which literally developed you know, a, a facade or a structure that was almost transparent. Those building technologies were certainly brought over to the, to the US, the United States, where um, you know, our uh, modern uh, uh, development of uh, industrial production uh, started to apply those to uh, high-rise buildings. And the struggle of adapting you know, new high-rise technology structural systems and the result of facade expressions um, uh, by Lewis Sullivan, you know, how do we treat building facades that are no longer needed to be uh, you know, load-bearing, but could be uh, just hung off of our new structural systems. We had architects such as Frank Lloyd Wright starting to experiment with open plans, free-flowing space, the, the, the kind of juxtaposition of inside and outside. Um, really, the, 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 the essential ingredient in, in modern architecture probably came from the, the Bauhaus in, in uh, Dessau, Germany after World War I, <clears throat> when much of Europe was decimated by uh, the war. Uh, there was a collection of uh, great minds of uh, not only art, sculpture, fabrics, uh, painting, uh, but also architecture that really defined a new aesthetic. Uh, many of those uh, uh, architects uh, in Europe embrace those and we have many uh, surviving icons including the Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier outside of Paris which was really a radical departure from any kind of traditional house. Um, here you can see some of those principles that Le Corbusier espoused in his uh, treaties. You know the, the, the building floating on columns to allow space to flow inside and underneath and around the building itself to Mies van der Rohe's uh, Barcelona Pavilion in uh, 1929, which uh, the, 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 the boundaries of inside and outside virtually disappear. Uh, those uh, design philosophies were brought, of course, to the United States. Uh, many of those architects emigrated uh, at the beginning of uh, World War II to escape uh, the Nazi regime, um, and many of those uh, uh, building designs took root in California, of course, Richard Neutra and many others with the case study houses. Um, and then it became very popular uh, to embrace that style. Philip Johnson, uh, you know, our friend that designed the Sheldon Memorial Art Gallery, Philip was never one, as you know, to invent uh, or uh, embrace uh, new design. He, he copied uh, much of what was uh, emerging trends or the avant-garde and brought them to uh, kind of the popular uh, uh, media, I'll say. Uh, this is his glass, glass house in New Cane, Connecticut, 1949. <clears throat> and then the corp uh, corporate America started to uh, embrace modernism in the Seagram Building in New York. We started to see many inventive and um, kind of uh, in, uh, you know, exploratory uh, new forms 
with aeroserenin, the TW terminate, terminal in New York in 1962, and of course our own Sheldon Memorial Art Gallery, which uh, Philip Johnson was starting to embrace what we call the new formalist kind of style, and Greg will talk a little bit more about that in a second. And we have many other examples of uh, modern architecture in our local uh, presence that uh, is certainly under the 50-year mark that, that uh, we should, probably should start to look uh, more carefully at. I know Pal has been on the, the forefront of, of uh, leading those discussions, and it's well worth noting those, including Pershing Auditorium and others. So as we approach uh, preserving modern buildings, uh, there are a few things that we wanted to uh, at least bring up in the discussion of, of what those differences are. Certainly, um, modern architecture versus uh, uh, traditional building, we, we, we have what we call a, a, the, the, the authenticity uh, discussion is certainly dif different and, and one that we have to start to think about differently as we approach preservation of modern buildings. Uh, traditional buildings are uh, really rooted in the, the, the uh, concept of craftsmanship. It's modular bricks being laid up by a craftsman, things that are carved and, and developed by hand, whereas modern uh, buildings uh, become um, much more uh, machine-made. Uh, they're much more uh, developed from systems. Um, so we, we lose that, um, uh, that craftsmanship or that uh, uh, dependency of, of thinking about uh, preserving materials, and we're starting to look at it, uh, systems, as well as design intent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the philosophies that modern, modern architects brought with them uh, uh, are just as important as the materiality that are uh, involved in their designs. So uh, that, the, that, that uh, notion of functionality, that form really follows function, is as important as design characteristic as the materials themselves. Uh, the role of the designer uh, really replaces the role of the craftsman in, in modern preservation. So um, that's another uh, kind of shift in thinking uh, that as restoration architects we need to uh, delve into and understand e even more. And as I mentioned, uh, there's a whole raft of new materials and systems that we are faced with in modern buildings. Uh, a window is not just a, an opening in a wall now. A window becomes a whole system of cladding a building. So uh, as you see in, in this uh, Mies building in Chicago, a window is really the curtain wall that clads the entire building. So one uh, change in that, in that application or that system has great implications uh, for uh, the entire building preservation concept. And then uh, lastly, this concept of newness. Um, in traditional preservation philosophies, the, the, the notion that a building or materials can uh, have a patina of age that goes along with them was, was discussed a lot by you know, individuals like Ruskin and William Morris. And that became an important part of the character of a traditional building. Whereas in modern preservation, buildings are new, they're fresh, they're crisp, they're clean. Um, so is that something that we need to respect um, as we look at modern buildings, that, that they should always be kept clean and fresh and crisp? And then lastly, uh, before Greg, Greg gets up and, and chats with you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're faced after World War II, this flood of new materials and this experimentation with chemistry and how that uh, created new materials such as plastics and, and uh, uh, new caulking and new uh, sealant materials. Some that uh, worked and some that just failed immediately. Uh, many of these materials are in inherent in our modern buildings that we as preservationists need to uh, carefully think about because many of these materials are no longer available or as you see on the, the lower right, uh, 
the Ebstone uh, shingles, of course, <laughs> contained asbestos. Um, so, you know, some of those materials are, are certainly hazardous and we need to, to, uh, to uh, address in our approach. So the last thought I want to leave with you is the, the, the approach that we take in preserving traditional buildings and modern buildings is really the same. Uh, we need to, um, you know, be careful stewards looking at the, the guidelines, but sometimes we need to have new interpretations of the Secretaries of, of Stan uh, Secretary of Interior Standards. It needs to be a rigorous process, meaning we need to really understand not only the materials that are used, but the designer's intent um, that in many cases we're adapting these new buildings to, to or these uh, modern buildings to new uses. So we need to balance the program requirements against uh, uh, some of those modern principles. And then lastly, this notion of a collaborative approach that uh, it really takes a, a wide range of talents and experts on, on a traditional preservation project still applies to a, a modern uh, preservation project. So with that, I'll uh, introduce my partner here, Greg Munn, who will walk you through a, a recent project that, that we completed um, out at the Stewart Museum in Grand Island. As Dan mentioned, the magic age for a building to be put on the National Register or be considered historic is 50. Uh, we started working on this building, though, um, over nine years ago when the building was just 40. And when we started uh, looking at this building, we were asked to take a look at this building and its, uh, its challenges and needs. Uh, I must admit, at the beginning, I don't think we were uh, thinking of it in terms of historic preservation. But as, because the whole idea of preserving a modern building was a pretty modern thought. Uh, but as we got into it, we realized the, uh, the integrity and the architectural uh, importance of this building. Uh, but first I want to just remind you all, or if you, or if you don't know, uh, what the Story Museum the Prairie Pioneer is. It is a, a, a building uh, completed in 1967, as was the, the whole museum. And you can see here, <clears throat> it is the square building on the Round Island in the Round uh, Lake in uh, Grand Island, Nebraska, about 90 miles uh, west of here. And uh, there's two major components of the museum. It's the museum building itself, which houses artifacts uh, from the, the pioneer peoples of Nebraska, and uh, this recreated town, the railroad town, uh, that surrounds uh, the area. So in the early 60s, about 1963, the people of Grand Island, who were thinking about uh, building a museum, uh, thought, let's do something uh, extraordinary. Let's uh, find uh, a world-class architect, invite him to Nebraska, and see if he'll design us uh, a museum. And they picked Edward Durrell Stone. Uh, his name is getting popular again, uh, but I, th I think history has uh, forgive me, forgotten him for, for a while, uh, but his career lasted from the late 20s until his death in the late 70s. He had 50 years uh, as being in the forefront of American modern architecture. Uh, I.M. Pei and uh, Philip Johnson were his contemporaries. And uh, the, some buildings that he's most famous for are uh, uh, two Columbus Circle in the center there. There was a controversy about that just over 10 years ago because uh, they decided to modernize that building and you can see on the left in the center there what it looked like in, uh, to his design. On the right, what it looks like today. And really, that one building uh, sparked the debate, I would say, on how to preserve uh, and why to preserve modern architecture. He also designed the uh, Museum of Modern Art in the 30s. He did the interior, actually, of Radio City Music Hall in 29, and uh, some other buildings that you can see, uh, like the Levitt Office Building in North Carolina, uh, that will become very familiar in, in their form. He also designed the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi and the Kennedy, Kennedy Center in, in Washington, for instance. And uh, this is where we're getting into new formalism, which is its modern architecture, as uh, Mies van der Rohe would say, would, would explain, but, but also there's, a, there's an, an element of uh, classical architecture to it. You can see the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi there, for instance. Uh, it's, a, it's a wide roof with columns around it. I mean, squint and think Parthenon, but it in a modern form. 
So he came to Nebraska and he designed this building in 63. As I said, a square building on a square plinth on a round island and a round uh, lake. <laughs> and uh, it was way over budget. <clears throat> and so that was in 63. So uh, they went into a uh, money raising uh, campaign which took three to four years. Uh, the, the cost was over double of what they had expected uh, to pay. Um, but they finally got it underway and it's a concrete waffle slab you can see on the upper left and uh, CMU uh, block walls. It was meant to be cast concrete panels for the exterior walls. And on the lower right you can see an icon of 60's architecture. That's carpet going on the walls and uh, the building form uh, getting complete in the lower uh, right there. So first of all we went in to look at the condition of the building. Um, the, in, the great thing about it, it was, uh, it was a time capsule. You walk in and you look at this building and, and just about everything was original. But the problem is just about everything was original. The mechanical system uh, was, was breaking down constantly and they had to go on eBay worldwide to find parts to keep the thing running. The electrical system was original and there wasn't very many outlets and I'll go into that, you know, what that was like. Um, the cabinetry was, was uh, falling apart and it was particle board and, and uh, the restrooms were not ADA accessible. There wasn't enough for them, especially now since they were having busloads of children coming in. And there was over 30 leaks in the roof. And uh, you know, there, uh, here's some pictures of the mechanical system and major spaces were just becoming storage and they were being totally overrun uh, by that. And uh, the exterior walls, uh, as I said, were CMU and they put on a new material called Granulux over top of the, the CMU. And what Granulux is, I think it was popular from maybe 1966 to 68 because no one's really ever heard of it before. We had to do a lot of research to find it but it's a uh, plaster-like exterior matrix material with uh, marble chips in it, so the building would sparkle a little bit. Um, but you can see it's, uh, it's coming apart and it was wearing off and we had to uh, scrape the building clean of this stuff. And uh, the black mastic on the, on the corner beads uh, had asbestos in it. So we went through many trials of finding materials, but we finally did something that was pretty close that we had specially made that actually does have marble chips uh, put in it to put on there. So this is an example of intent versus material. You can't really uh, preserve uh, or recreate or reconstruct uh, asbestos. So we had to find another way, something else to do. Uh, here, so but we were maintaining the intent. We have the look. We have what uh, Stone had wanted and what Stone had envisioned, but it was in a new material, and and that's that's uh, basic for many buildings of this era, and especially this one. You can't restore asbestos, cardboard, and plastic, but you do want to keep it fresh and 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 uh, as the inter architect intended. The fascia around the top, this is one of those things that was value engineered at the time of construction. Uh, these panels here are meant to, were uh, meant to be uh, precast concrete in the original plans and they couldn't afford that at the time. So they just put up that granulux stuff and stamped these squares into it. And you can see it's deteriorating quite badly. We have the original drawings. Um, so one thing we were able to do, uh, which is uh, to me a little controversial and I think this, this question needs to be answered uh, and will be in the future, but we had the money now to make the precast concrete panels originally designed for the building, so that's what we did. We, 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 are, we, fu we f actually in a way finished the building for stone. This, this was never there but this is what he had wanted and we were able to add it in this project. Uh, this is a museum. Now that means the environment needs to be tightly controlled. Well, this building had no insulation and single pane windows throughout. So uh, you can imagine um, it doesn't meet modern standards uh, for museums. So we had to replace all the windows with uh, uh, double pane windows. And the frames were steel painted, but we put in a 
anodized bronze finish so that we get the, the look and the profile of the original windows uh, in the building. And floors and ceilings, there's a lot of terrazzo on the main floor, but uh, much of the building had asbestos floor tiles, of course. Even the uh, texture plaster in the ceilings had, had asbestos in it, as well as you know, insulation and all the piping throughout the building. Uh, the place was just full of asbestos, of course. This is 1967. Uh, lighting that had this waffle slab uh, throughout the second floor, and they had these ingenious, interesting uh, lights up inside the, the waffles with conduits through the concrete of, of the, the slab. Um, but of course, those were inadequate. And you can see these little holes in the side. Those were the plug-ins <laughs> for the, uh, the lighting, as you can see in the upper left-hand uh, photograph. There weren't, there weren't enough outlets in the building, and they had cords hanging everywhere trying to light things up. And uh, the lighting was, was very dated, uh, naturally. Well, and appropriately, it's from that period, uh, but was not sufficient anymore to light the uh, displays. So we took a look at the building, the, the, uh, the uh, condition of it. It was pretty tired. Uh, it needed a lot of work. Uh, so, but there was also several code deficiencies in the building uh, that didn't meet either uh, museum standards or just ADA compliance. Uh, there was the program had evolved. Uh, they have collections, of course, but they were, this is also an interpretive center uh, for the museum. This was to be a community center that the people of Grand Island could use, and uh, they were getting more and more into banquets and receptions, weddings and such, which many museums are, are going to uh, into today. So that, of course, meant looking at catering kitchens and those sorts of things. And we, went, we had to balance all of that while maintaining the intent of the architect, trying to make this building look as it was designed, uh, um, but updating at the, th at the same time. So quickly, code deficiencies, there was only a door in the north and the south. There wasn't even enough exiting on the building. Um, the building did not have sprinklers. Uh, the four red squares in the center, those are pools of water. Now that's interesting for a museum, you know, trying to control the climate. This has pools of fountains inside, but that was a stone thing. Many of his buildings have pools. Uh, originally, they did not have railings around them, and uh, it's very sleek, modernist look, and I'll show you some photographs of that later on. But uh, the problem is people were looking up at the space and kept falling into the pools, so they had to add these uh, little pen railings, some people call them pig pens, sorry, uh, that destroy the look of the space, and that happened soon after the place was opened. And the green square, that is uh, the restrooms, the size of the restrooms, which is uh, very inadequate uh, for, for the use of the building. So what we did was uh, we added doors on the east and west that match the north and the south, so all four sides of the building, although different, it's, it's now all, we have doors on the center of each of each side. We greatly expanded the size of the restrooms and added some on the second floor in the grand o um, open gallery uh, space and, and multiple things to meet code compliance. With all of that information, the use in code and condition, we had to decide are we uh, going to follow the uh, Secretary of Interior's standards. And uh, we chose to do uh, rehabilitation on the, this building, and that was an evolution. I mean, as we worked on this, as I said, it was nine years we got started. The building was getting closer and closer to 50 years old as, as we were, were doing this and realizing this, hey, stone is important and this building is important and we need to preserve it, uh, it its intent at least. Um, so we did follow this, the uh, Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation um, to where when you reconstruct a material, you want it to have the same characteristics of, of the original is, is one of the, the, the tenets of um, uh, rehabilitation. And we had to, we had to uh, identify the character-defining features of the building. Of course, the form itself, you know, the, the, the building on, on a plinth with the columns, uh, the waffle slab ceiling, uh, and uh, this water court. Uh, the water garden in the center of the space. This is what I was talking about. This is how it looked when it opened 
and with no railings, and you can just imagine kind of walking and falling into these things. And, and uh, these plants, an another uh, interesting idea for a museum, but there's, there's plants hanging down from these, these fixtures in the, in the center. And you can't see it in these photographs, but there's a dome on the, on the top with, with skylights in it that lights up this center space. So this is what we ended up doing. Uh, this room on the upper left, that is the uh, Cronin Hall, a family in Grand Island donated the money to do this uh, room at the time of construction in the 60s. It had uh, oak walls. Uh, it was meant to be a, a gathering space, but it turned into a library and uh, a multifunctional room. And you can see uh, what it ended up being. There was, there was many bookshelves and things just bolted to the walls, and uh, the room was uh, pretty tired by the time we got to it. The other thing, too, is, you know, we, we talked, we labored over whether to pull off or restore this, this oak, but it was, it was banged up pretty bad. And the other thing is, too, we needed to insulate this building, so we had to pull all the oak off and fur out all the exterior walls and insulate, and then we also put in the new windows. So this is the end result. This is new oak, and this is all the same window. This is the same corner of, the, of, of that room. Um, we got to the intent. Uh, we, we uh, rebuilt the room. This is all new materials, but it's as, as Stone uh, envisioned it. And as Ed Dan said before, um, one part about modern architecture is new and fresh. So think about, is restoring it meaning replacing it with new? That, that is a, a question that will be debated. Uh, the gallery space, they had these temporary um, uh, display pieces uh, built in 67 that were supposed to be replaced by something better soon after. Well, they were still there in 2013, and, and this is uh, how they looked then, but we designed this whole new um, display system, and these large boxes, they actually have storage inside, and there's, there's wheels on them. And you can also see that we had the original lights replicated in LED uh, with, with these uh, task lights throughout. So we brought up the quality of light and the amount of light in the space. But we used the same, even the same conduits that were in the concrete slab that Stone had designed. Uh, there was a small kitchen for making tea and sandwiches off the Cronin uh, Hall. And uh, it was woefully out of date. And most of the, this is all one appliance. This is pretty cool. It's the sink, your dishwasher, and your, your oven and fridge all in one piece. Um, so couldn't really restore that. So we, we pulled that out and made a, made a new kitchen uh, using uh, uh, materials and the aesthetic uh, that I think we, we would think hope, uh, Stone would, um, would hopefully approve of. And then there was the larger catering kitchen, uh, which, as I said, banquets and receptions and, and those sorts of things uh, needed much better facilities. So we expanded that within the footprint of the building. And you can see the original on the, on the left and the new, the new kitchen on the right, which I think they're quite pleased with. Uh, there's a gift shop at the front. In the 60s, the gift shop was a small uh, little corner by the door hidden in the back. And, uh, we, and it had changed many, many times over the years, and it was pretty cobbled together. Uh, we opened that all up again. And this is not an original uh, space finish, but we used other finishes that were throughout the building and made this much bigger. Uh, gift shop, which also the person at the front desk can run the front door of, of, of the museum there uh, from that spot. So this, this is the, the money shot, I think it would say. There's the uh, original water garden in 1967 up at the upper left. Um, how it looked before our project started, here is those gates they had to add um, to keep people from falling into the water. And this is what it looked like uh, when we were uh, doing the project, and this is how it looks today. What we did was we wanted to keep the vista open as much as we possibly could, but it was a safety issue uh, with those pools, so we put in these, these glass uh, rails, tempered glass rails all the way around. Um, so you can still get a sense of the floor plates uh, moving through uh, without having to look at the pens like that. So hopefully Stone would be pleased. We also took out, you know, these were plastic plants hanging from there because the real plants were no longer uh, uh, 
easy to take care of and they kept growing down and people were banging their heads going up the stairs. So we converted them into light fixtures that light up the dome and all the lighting throughout the building is LED. So we completed the rehabilitation the last July of 40, what, 48 years from the, uh, from the, the week that it, it opened and we have the, the new uh, precast panels on there, the new Granny Lux like finish on the outside and it's fresh and new and this is how pretty much it looked the day it opened. And we also uh, wrote the nomination to put it on the National Register and it was accepted last year. So even though the building was, didn't quite make the 50 year mark, it was only 48, uh, uh, it was recognized to be a significant enough building that uh, we could put it on the register and we made it. So these are some pictures uh, just flipping through the inside. Uh, marble walls in the inside for the donors. As you come in, another shot of the uh, water garden and the stairs. Really the terrazzo floor and the stairs and that wood railing are pretty much the only pieces within the building that we didn't touch. Um, we tried to do a light touch from the very beginning and that touch became bigger and bigger as we went as we found out that uh, more and more of the material, original material was disintegrating or falling apart. But we feel pretty good that we put it back together and Stone could walk in the building today and recognize it. And this is photographs of the rededication. There's Dan and, and Steve from our office um, and uh, Joe Black, director of the museum, and Pam and other people at the, uh, at the uh, opening. So, do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Laurie. Were the administrative offices, Greg, in that building originally? Uh, the question is, were the administrative offices in the building originally? Uh, yes, they were. And, and then at some point, the building got so crowded, uh, they were putting people in, literally in large closets, and then they moved them out at some point. Um, there are no offices at all in the building now. We, we got all of that out and we were able to expand um, the uh, display space and storage space, which they really needed. There was too many things going on in the building, so we got them out. Any more questions? Yes. Greg, uh, nice, nice work, um, very nice project. I, I, your use of things like precast fascia panels, I think is, is, um, is very commendable. Um, knowing that Stone would have wanted those to begin with, knowing too that you're trying to do what's best for the facility long term, because you've got a client who's not probably very interested in doing a major renovation every 20 or 30 mm -hmm. years. That kind of long-term view toward one, meeting the original design intent, and two, putting in a system that will require very little maintenance in relative terms over the long term is really is really quite good. So I, I think it's it's I happened to see it just before you went into the process of restoration mm -hmm. and it was in very, very poor condition as you indicate. And I I can't imagine they aren't related with not only what they enjoy today but what they'll enjoy as it's built for many years to come. So nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Do I shall I repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do want to bring up one thing about that, though, uh, and that, that is a question that I find very intriguing. Uh, Bob had mentioned that we had <clears throat> replaced the Granny Lux um, fascia with the, the, the precast concrete panels that were originally designed but were not there. So uh, I just find it fascinating as, as a theory that, in a way, we are restoring uh, what should have been original, <laughs> but, was, but wasn't there. But it, it is also a more durable material and uh, is actually closer to the intent of the architect. But I thank you. Did, you. did you have good documentation of the original construction? Did you have most of the original construction documents? And design intent was made a little more clear as a result of having that documentation? The question is, did we have the original uh, construction documents for the building? Interesting. We had the original construction documents as it was designed in 1963, but not as it was built. 
So our documents had the precast panels for the walls. It had a basement in it. It had a different floor plan. Um, this building was built on the floodplain, so they discovered later, oh, can't have a basement. Uh, but there was many things. Uh, the intent was there, the details were there, but actually as we dug into the building, we discovered the plans were almost completely just that much off. <laughs> there was nothing we could really follow and trust to the T because it had changed. So you necessarily then did a thorough job of documenting what was there, the as-built, so that there's no mistake of what you did, but it ties in well with the original design intent working from the drawings, but you documented what was there and was likely, in many cases, replaced. Yeah, the, the question is, uh, we did, you know, did we uh, document the building um, uh, as well as not, you know, just not relying on the drawings. We, ha we ended up doing, um, that was an ongoing process because as the demolition uh, was going on, um, that's when we started to uncover the difference, a lot of the differences that were, uh, we di didn't even realize were different than what was in the drawings. Um, we knew there were some major some differences and changes, but once we started digging into the building, that was an ongoing process right to the end of, of uh, do documenting and, and uh, uh, redefining what we were doing as we went. Any more questions? Yes? I have two questions. Number one, could you tell the difference in the acoustics in that center grand space? And two, what about the landscape? As you put the new doors in on the east and west, how did you impact the landscape? First question was about the acoustics of the space. Um, in the, the grand space, if I can go back to this, that one there, um, there is the, this space has the most original materials uh, in it, and it has the terrazzo floors. Uh, we added carpeting uh, to, the, to, to the upper gallery space for acoustic reasons and for other reasons. Um, but in this space, the acoustics are, are uh, probably quite equal to, to what they uh, were originally, which isn't bad. The thing is, the nice thing about having these pools of water and these, these trickling fountains is that gives a nice soothing, you know, noise deadening effect to, to the whole space. The second question was about the landscaping and adding those the east and west doors. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because on the uh, on the east side we added the door uh, okay this is the south this is the front entry so imagine all four sides are identical so this door on that side <laughs> when you come out and you walk on the plinth there are now steps down to uh, the, the garden level, the, the lawn level, because they envision having a lot of indoor-outdoor events on that side. Um, so that is going to uh, greatly increase uh, the use of, of the building. Uh, they, are, they are now incorporating more of the entire island than they ever have before. Another interesting thing too that I noticed looking at this is originally uh, there was these uh, white crab trees built all around uh, the, the plants uh, that were planted when the, when the building was opened, uh, they died within very few years and uh, we were even now to put back the, uh, the white apple trees uh, in their original locations. So this building is looking more itself than it has in a very long time. No more questions? Yes. How many generations of materials did you find on the interior of the building on average? Right? Because likely they did some small renovation over time. Did you find two or three generations of wall finishes or things of that nature? Uh, interesting question. The, the question is, uh, was there multiple generations of materials found on the interior or on the building at all? And uh, really, I would say 90% of it it's first generation. There, there wasn't, the carpet was still on there. Um, they've repainted in a few places, but they lose the original color, which we were able to match and use again. Uh, but Dan, I don't think of anything that was really up, updated in the past 48 no, uh, years. No, I think, Bob, um, there were a couple of places like some of the kitchenettes where 
-hmm. Some cabinet doors had come off and they'd replaced those. <laughs> yeah, minor things like you know, that. Uh, vinyl tile had popped up and they'd replaced it, tried to match it as best they could, but it was pretty much original. There were no renovations yeah. really yeah. of any size yeah. over time. Yeah. I don't want to be the only one. <laughs> <laughs> You're very curious today, Bob. Yeah. The, the pyramidion on the roof, mm -hmm. uh, my understanding was that originally that was intended by stone to be copper clad. Um, is, is, did that make it into a kind of a variation? Was it, was it done in copper? Was it done in uh, another colored metal for the, uh, the roof pyramid? Yeah, it's hard to see here, but uh, yes, the roof was originally, oh, the question was uh, about the pyramidal roof on the top, the uh, far-sided um, uh, roof, uh, what was its original material, and had it changed, and what did we do to change that? It was uh, originally in copper, and it was in these uh, diamond shape. They weren't actually quite square, but they, they, were, they were diamond shaped panels with a standing seam system, and in, imagine it in every V, it captured snow and water and rain and dirt, so that roof leaked uh, pretty quickly. That was probably the biggest change that they mm -hmm. did was, I think within very few years, they replaced it with a standing seam uh, metal roof, and it was in green to replicate that patinaed copper yeah. color. Uh, they actually put on a rubber roof, which would have been watertight, but then they nailed the standing seam <laughs> through it uh, because that was one thing we wasn't in the budget or wasn't in the plan was to replace that roof and when we investigated it we, we realized we had to redo that as well. Um, the, the, the diamond shaped panels were not going to work again, we just didn't go there. Um, so we put on uh, uh, anodized bronze uh, colored um, panel, uh, standing seam panel system that matched the color finish of the windows. So, so it it's like a little bit of a difference. Yeah. yeah. So it looks like an aged copper, but not quite the green. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing we had to upgrade was, yeah. it would have been beautiful to do the, the, the diamond patterns, and we looked at that, but it just wasn't practical. Was it a membrane initially, like a, like a geared membrane? It was a, a, a bitumen uh, roof. Originally. Okay. Anything else? No more questions. Okay. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you.